Turn to Proverbs 8, 9. Proverbs 8, 9. It says, They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. So the they and the them, those pronouns refer back to the previous verse, talking about wisdom's words, where she says, All the words of my mouth are in frowardness. There is nothing per, or froward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth. So the words of wisdom are plain to him that understandeth. So let's look at that first part there. So this is telling us that all of wisdom's words are plain to him that understands. And those are the two key words there in this phrase that we want to look at. Plain and understands. Plain is open, clear to the senses or mind, evident, manifest, obvious, easily distinguishable or recognizable, of which the meaning is evident, simple, intelligible, readily understood. So when something is plain, it's easy to understand, it's out there in the open, it's not obscure, it's not darkened, it's easily distinguishable, recognizable, it's clear. It says the words of wisdom's mouth are plain to him that understandeth. To understand is to comprehend, to apprehend the meaning or import of, to grasp the idea of. So when you understand something, you get it, in other words. Grasp the idea of it, right? You apprehend it. That's when somebody says, oh, I get it, when you're trying to explain something to them. They're saying, I understand. So to the man that has, uh, who has the ability to comprehend the meaning of wisdom's words, her message is obvious, easily recognizable, simple, and readily understood. But you have to have understanding for it to be so. If the man, if somebody doesn't have understanding, then the words are not plain. They're not understandable. They're confusing. So the man who does not have the ability to understand wisdom's message is not evident. It's not easily distinguishable. It's not simple, but it's rather obscure and difficult to comprehend. It would be kind of like reading in a foreign language, right? You could have the, the simplest sentence ever, the most plain thing ever in your own language, which anybody could understand, but you take that same message, put it in a foreign language, and it doesn't matter if you have an IQ of 160, you could, if you didn't know that language, you could not understand what is written on the page. Wisdom's words are the same way. To the person that has understanding, the words are plain and simple. It's like reading it in your own language. But to the person that doesn't have understanding, it's just like reading some other just mixed up gobbledygook of words. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything to them. Well, the thing is, the natural man in his fallen state doesn't have understanding. He can't understand God's words. And this goes back to some basic doctrine uh, called total depravity. In Romans 3 and verse 11, Romans 3.11, this is talking about all mankind, Jews and Gentiles, all of us are under sin. And in verse 11, it says, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. So, in man's natural state, nobody understands. That's why you take the average guy on the street, chances are the average guy on the street is not one of God's children, because God's children are in the vast minority. You take the average guy on the street, and he doesn't understand the Word of God. You tell him, you explain to him the doctrine of God, and you give him a verse that makes it as plain as can be, and it just doesn't click with him. It doesn't, doesn't sink in. It doesn't mean anything to him. It's just a, it's a foolish message to them, right? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Um, Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8 and verse 43, John 8, 43, Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? It's pretty hard to understand if you can't hear, right? You take a deaf person, if they can't read lips or something, well, they're not going to understand because the words can't even enter their minds. It's the same way spiritually. The words can't enter a person's mind and heart if they're not born again, regenerate, and therefore they can't understand those words. Jesus went on to say in verse 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. So in order to hear God's words with understanding, you have to be of God, which means that you have to be born of God, right? You have to be um, a child of God. But if you're not a child of God, if you're not born again, then you can't hear 
and understand the Word of God. And that's why you can preach to some people till you're blue in the face, and they're just, they're never going to get it. They're, they're, they're not a child of God. They don't have the, the spiritual capacity to understand what is being spoken. But then other people hear the exact same message. And they may not be some super genius. They may just be a common person, right? That's what Jesus, uh, that's who he preached to. He said the common people heard him gladly. Could just be a common guy. And he hears the gospel, same message that the, that the other guy heard. And it means something to him. He understands it. It, it, has, it comes with clicks. It comes with power and conviction. And it's not because of their intelligence. It's because one's born of God and one isn't. Uh, in Second Peter 2 and verse 12, it talks about, the wicked here who speak evil of things which they understand not. Second Peter 2.12 But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They speak evil of the scriptures, the things they understand not, the doctrine. Heaven, I mean, we, we see this all the time in our wicked culture, our wicked generation, people speak evil of the scriptures, they speak evil of the, of the truth of God's word, it's because they don't understand it. And to them, it's foolishness and it's irritating because it's steps on their toes, it tells them things about themselves they don't like, it prohibits them from doing things they want to do, and then they speak evil of it. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That is, the spiritual things, the things of the Spirit of God, they're spiritually discerned. It means that you have to have that new spirit to discern, to understand the spiritual things. But the natural man, he doesn't receive those things. They never can enter into his heart. They never, they, it never clicks to him because he doesn't have the spirit to discern them. They're foolishness to him. And the reason is because he's spiritually dead. Remember Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. When you're dead, you don't have spiritual discernment. When you're spiritually dead, that is. So to know the things of God, a man must first receive the Spirit, which is from God, which comes through regeneration by the Holy Ghost. You just look up a couple of verses in 1 Corinthians 2.12. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's why one person can know the knowledge of salvation, right? Salvation is freely given to us of God. Uh, one person can know and understand salvation. He can know and understand the scriptures, which are freely given to us of God, because he's received the spirit, which is of God. The spirit that is from God, the new spirit, the new birth, when he's received that, he can know the things that are freely given to him of God. But if he's got the spirit of the world in his heart, He's a natural man, in other words. He can't understand. It says in Ecclesiastes that God hath put the world in their hearts um, so that no man can uh, no man can know something or other. Uh, I'd have to find that verse. Let me see if I can find that one. I think it's in Ecclesiastes 8, but I could be wrong. He said he hath put the world in their hearts. Anyway, I might not be able to find it. I'm not seeing it right now. But uh, that's, that's the spirit of the world anyway. I can find that one later. So that spirit which is of God comes from God, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. In Titus 3 and verse 5 it says... Uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So that's when that spirit, which is of God, is given to us in that act of regeneration, when 
that dead spirit is taken out and a new born again living spirit is put in there. That's the act of regeneration. That's the renewing. And when you receive that spirit, then you can understand spiritual things. So once a person has been eternally saved by the grace of God, wisdom's words are no longer foolishness to him, but they are understandable and they have a powerful influence in his life. And that's 1 Corinthians 1.18. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. So wisdom says that her words are all plain to him that understandeth. And when you come over to the New Testament, especially in contrast to the Old Testament, the New Testament's written in great plainness of speech. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 12. The Old Testament was different. It was written in signs and types and shadows and uh, similitudes, things like that. Uh, and there's a lot of the Old Testament that is not easy to be understood. Uh, there's plenty of some of the prophets, especially some of the minor prophets, and, and plenty of the major ones that I read that uh, I don't honestly have a clue what it's talking about. It's A lot of that stuff, I think, is historical. It was historically fulfilled and I just don't know the history. If it's not, some of the histories in the Bible, some of it probably isn't of various prophecies and things that happened. And so, you know, a lot of that stuff is uh, is quite difficult to understand. But you come over to the New Testament, and it's another story. It's a lot easier to understand. There are difficult parts in the New Testament, but but a lot of it is is pretty pretty plain. Second uh, Corinthians three twelve. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. Right? Moses didn't use great plainness of speech. The old prophets didn't use great plainness of speech. But Paul said in the New Testament, they did. So saints who have been quickened or regenerated or born again by the Spirit of God can understand the words of God when they read them. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 5, I'll give you the verse which says that we can understand if we read it, but first I want to give you the verse which tells us why we can understand these things when we read them. Ephesians 2, 5, he just got done describing people that are dead in their sins, uh, which we all were, and he says there in verse 5, but... When we were, uh, I'm sorry, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved. So, quickening is making alive, making spiritually alive. It's the same thing as regeneration. It is your salvation by grace, ye are saved. And this is just a slight side note, but I, it has finally dawned on me the fundamental error of Calvinism. The fundamental error, as I can see it anyway, of Calvinism is that they do not understand that regeneration and eternal salvation and eternal life are the same thing. That eternal life and eternal salvation are caused by regeneration. When somebody is regenerated, they're given eternal salvation and eternal life. I've Finally, this has dawned on me. I've been reading this book in Baptist Church History and it's showing throughout history that Baptist churches have been sovereign grace or Calvinistic, uh, a lot of them. And, and it's giving all these old preachers, and he's taking excerpts out of what they wrote and, and showing us what they believed. And almost every one of them is a gospel regenerationist. They believe that you have to hear the gospel in order to be saved. And, but yet they say that regeneration precedes faith. So they believed that regeneration, that is being born again, that new spirit put in you, that that precedes faith. So when a person is, they, they get this, regenerate, you're regenerated first, and then you can have faith because you've been regenerated. But what they then think is that when you exercise that faith, that's when you're saved eternally. So they believe that God regenerates you so that you can have faith, and then once you have faith, once you hear the gospel and you believe it, that's when you're saved eternally. That's why they call it saving faith. And their fundamental error is regeneration is eternal life. It is eternal salvation. That's why that's they get all messed up. 
because they think that God regenerates you to, to give you the ability to have faith. When you have faith and you get saved, but they miss that whole point, that when God regenerates you, that is when he saved you. That is when he gave you eternal life. You are saved life. Then. Now, when you say Calvinistic, are they the ones then that think that if you backslide, you actually never had it? Yes, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that you have to persevere. Mm-hmm. And, and, so, and that all kind of goes together. I mean, if you, if, if you had to believe in order to get saved, well, then if you stop believing, you're not saved or you never were saved. I mean, it's kind of it all, it all goes together. And it finally, I was just, it finally clicked with me because for a long time I thought that they believed that regeneration and belief were simultaneous or something, that, that you, you, you're regenerated and you immediately believe. And I didn't get the fact that, that they, didn't, they don't, didn't, don't understand that regeneration and eternal salvation are the same thing. So do they believe that everybody is given by the Lord faith? No, just the elect. So they believe that, that God elected, Christ died for their sins, then the Spirit regenerates the elect, gives them, well, I was going to say eternal life, gives them the ability to repent and believe, and only the elect can repent and believe, and then when they do believe, that's when they're saved. So your accepting is a sign of your election, basically. Yeah. It's, because it, if you stop yes. believing, then you're not elect. Right. right. Now, they would say you can temporarily fall away, you could temporarily backslide, but you never completely backslide, you never die in your sins or something, is what they would say. So then they would not believe that every single one of those elect would. Oh, they will. They do. No, they they believe every single every one, single of, one of the elect. Then they don't yes. have to say that Christ died for all the elect, but some of them are going to hell. Right. They, yep. Okay. Yep. And that's why they believe that all of the elect will believe, because in their, in their minds, all the elect have to believe, because if you don't believe, you can't, you're not saved, right? You're saved when you believe. Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay. anyway, that, the, the reason why I did that is, number one, it's been on my mind, but number two, this verse just equates those things. Okay. Even when we were dead in sins, Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved. That parenthesis there, he's telling you what that quickening together with Christ is. By grace you're saved. That's when God saved you, when he quickened you. And that's an eternal salvation. That is eternal salvation, mm-hmm. yep. Now, where they, go, where they go wrong is that in truth, God regenerates, and when God regenerates, that is when he gives you eternal life. Mm-hmm then you have the ability to believe and repent. When you believe and repent, you experience temporal salvation, mm-hmm. not eternal salvation, and right. that's where they, they get it mixed up. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that, now I know what to ask Calvinists. When I talk to a Calvinist, and I really want to get down to the root of it, that's what I ask him. And it's going to be interesting. I hope I get a chance, because I do know some Calvinists, mm-hmm. and I see them once in a while, and I'm, I'm interested to ask them and um, and and have them explain to me how regeneration is not the same as eternal salvation, if that's what they believe. Of course, there's varying, varying beliefs among Calvinists, too, so they're not all the same. But uh, anyway. So, by grace, he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And then, look at what you can do once he's quickened you. Ephesians 3 and verse 4. Paul says, let's just start, go back to verse 3. He says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What do you have to do to understand Paul's knowledge? Read. Whereby when ye read. But of course you have to be born again first. Because it, you can read without being born again. But you can't understand read, what you read in the Bible if you're not born again. So in order for the elect to do so and to understand the word of God, they need two things. They have the, the nature now to believe. They have the inward spirit that's capable of, of understanding. But they still need two things if they're really going to understand the word of God. The first one is they need to learn how to compare scripture with scripture because that is how the scripture is understood. Isaiah 28 Verses 9 through 10. 
Isaiah 28, 9 through 10. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? That's what we're talking about here, right? All the words of my mouth are plain to him that understandeth. So who is going to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's how somebody's made to understand doctrine. Precept upon precept. Compare one precept with another precept. Line upon line. Comparing one line of scripture with the other. Here a little, there a little. All of the the information about a given doctrine is not given in one place in the Bible or one verse in the Bible or one book of the Bible. It's spread around. A little bit bit of it's given here, a little bit of it's given in another place. So you have to compare scripture and put it together. This is what Paul called comparing spiritual things with spiritual in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13. Which, by the way, you would recognize this because you've been under this teaching for a long time, but maybe somebody that hasn't been can see just by listening to this Bible study that this is the very thing that I'm doing. This is what I've been doing, comparing Scripture with Scripture. And a lot of times you you do it and probably don't even realize it. But that's how Scripture is to be understood. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13. This is the verse right in the middle there about God giving us the Spirit so we can freely know the things that are of God and that the natural man can't receive them because he doesn't have the Spirit to. Right in the middle there in verse 13, "...which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual." That is how the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual or Scripture with Scripture. Here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept, line upon line. The second thing a person needs in order to understand the words of wisdom, to understand the word of God, is a preacher to help guide them to make the word of God manifest so that they can understand it. Acts 8, 30-31. There are a lot of people out there today, people in the house church movement and and just other people that, that would disagree with this. They don't, they don't think you need a, a preacher. Preachers are not necessary. All, all I need is the, the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Well, then why do so many people that have the Bible and the Holy Spirit don't have the foggiest idea about the doctrine that's being taught? Because everybody's got the Bible and the Holy Spirit, right, if you're born again. But yeah, you get a lot of people that don't understand what's being taught in the Bible. And why is that if all you need is the Bible and the Holy Spirit? Here's a guy that thought he needed more than the Bible and the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when I say more than the Bible and the Holy Spirit, this is how the Holy Spirit teaches, by sending a preacher to help make it manifest. Acts 8, 30 through 31. And Philip ran thither to him, this is to the Ethiopian eunuch that was coming back from Jerusalem after he had been worshiping. He was, an, he was a believer in the Old Testament, this Ethiopian eunuch was. He was a, a proselyte of the Jews. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, that's Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. See, the Ethiopian eunuch wasn't a proud fool and said, Oh yeah, I understand it all. i got the Holy Spirit. That's all I need, right? He wasn't like that. He, he wanted to understand. He didn't want to pretend like he understood. No, I don't understand what I'm reading here. He's reading in Isaiah 53. That's a very, very important passage of Scripture to understand. That was one of the most vivid prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? If you were a Jew or a proselyte, a converted, if you had converted to Judaism and you had not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, you could read through Isaiah 53, that vivid prophecy of the suffering of Christ, and you would think what the Ethiopian eunuch did. Is the prophet referring to himself or another man? You wouldn't know who he was referring to. And that's what the, what the eunuch said. He didn't know who it was referring to. And Philip um, preached the gospel to him and made it plain for him. But the eunuch realized that he needed some man to guide him. And he was humble enough to desire that. 
and then look at Titus 1 and verse 3. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure somebody would hear this and just think that I'm some arrogant jerk tooting my own horn. I'm not tooting my own horn at all. Titus 1 and verse 3. It says, But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. God in the New Testament has manifested, which means to make open and plain, he has manifested or made plain his word through preaching. So yes, you need the Holy Spirit. You have to be born again first of all. You have to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you giving you the ability to understand. You certainly need the Word of God, or you're not going to understand the Word of God without the Word of God. Obviously, you need that. You need to understand how to compare spiritual things with spiritual, but you know what else you need? You need a preacher to help you out. Like I said, some people don't think they need a preacher. But you know what? Maybe they're just super Christians. Maybe they're way more spiritual than I was. But you know what I needed when I was not yet converted? I needed a preacher. You know how I learned the doctrine? From a preacher. Yeah, I was reading, really trying to figure it all out on my own and understand it, and I was still pretty confused. I couldn't sort out free will and election and understand how it all went together until I started listening to sermons. And I'd listen to them over and over again, and I'd stop and I'd back it up, and I'd hear something. I knew there was, just, there was something there I just wasn't quite getting, and I just needed to hear it explained. And then... I got it. I needed a preacher. And that's why I ended up being converted. Not regenerated, converted, right? And then after I was converted, you know what I needed? A preacher. You know how much stuff I learned after I was converted going to church for all those years? Through preaching. No, I, yes, I studied the Bible myself. I learned some things on my own, no doubt. But you know where I learned the vast majority of the things that I know? From a preacher. You know what I need now? A preacher. A preacher. <laughs> I need a preacher now. Yeah. You say you are a preacher. Well, I still need a preacher because there are still things that I don't understand. And guess what? When I can't understand it and I try to figure it out myself and I, I compare Scripture with Scripture and I look up in the commentaries and I can't figure it out, you know what I do? Call I call preacher. a preacher. I need a preacher too. Right? That's the way that God set it up. So anybody that, that doesn't think that they need a preacher doesn't understand the way that God has ordained that his word be disseminated and made manifest. Of course, that's not to say that you can't understand the Bible by reading it yourself. You certainly can. And when you listen to preaching, then you do as the Bereans, and you go home and you search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. And then you take what you've learned, and once you've learned some things, and then you read the Bible, and all of a sudden a lot more of the Bible is going to start making sense because now you have some of the fundamental doctrine that you learned through preaching, and then you can plug that in and you can really start to grow. That's the way that God's designed it. And then wisdom says that her, way, that her words are right to them that find knowledge. Wisdom's words are right to them that find knowledge. Right is of persons or disposition. Uh, when, when we're speaking of persons or disposition, it's disposed to do what is just or good, upright, righteous. When we're talking about actions or conduct, it's in accordance with what is just or good, equitable, morally fitting. It's agreeing with some standard or principle, correct, proper. Also, it's agreeing with facts or true. So when something is right, it's first of all righteous. Right? That's where the, where the word righteous, that's one of the root words in it, right, righteous. So it's something that is right is just, good, and righteous, but then it's also morally fitting, it's in accordance with what is good, and it's also in the sense of agreeing with facts. It's true. So something that is right is morally good and it's logically good, in both of those things. And the scripture teaches that God's words are right, they're upright, they're righteous, and they're true, which are all very similar to right. Wisdom says, my words are right to them that find knowledge. Let me just give you a couple of verses here. Uh, Psalm 19 and verse 8. Psalm 19. And verse 8. It says, the statutes of the Lord, which is just another term for 
the scripture for his the word of God. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. So God's statutes are right, and they therefore rejoice the heart. When you read something that's right and true, it should cause joy. That doesn't it, isn't it a joyful thing to find out the truth about God's word or about anything? Isn't it nice, nice to be able to finally figure out what is true? And so many times in this world, it's so hard to do. The only thing that we can be absolutely 100% confident about is what we find in the scripture because so much other stuff is distorted and you know people twist things and don't give you all the information and you, you hear something and it sounds really good until you hear the rest of the story, but you don't even know where to go to find the rest of the story, right? So, so many, it's so hard to find the truth sometimes, but not in the scripture. Uh, Psalm 33 and verse 4 it says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. And there's some other verses here, but in the interest of time, I'll just skip over them. That's Isaiah 45, 19 and 1 Kings eleven thirty eight. 38. Um, God's word is also upright. Psalm 111, 7 through 8. Psalm 111, 7 through 8. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. So God's words are upright, or in other words, they're righteous. They're morally perfect. There's nothing froward or perverse in them, as we've already seen from a previous verse. And then 119, 138, God's word is righteous. Psalm 119, 138, Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. And then in verse 160, God's word is true. Psalm 119, 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. It's true from the beginning. From the very first verse, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It's true from there till the last verse of the Bible, which ends with, Amen. That's actually the last word, but (laughs) it says, even so I come quickly, I think. Amen. Is that what it says? I thought you were going to make a statement. I I wasn't quizzing you on that book. Mm No, we're both wrong. (laughs) The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. From the first verse to the last verse, God's word is right. Right from the beginning. Now it says there that wisdom's words are right to them that find knowledge. That's interesting. Now, of course, wisdom's words are right, period. And they're right to people that don't find knowledge also, right? They just don't know they're right. They don't recognize them as right. But they are right in the sense of the person knowing they're right and being convinced that they're right to those that find knowledge. And this is interesting. To find is to discover or attain by search or effort, to discover or obtain by searching. So if you are to find something, it is by searching or seeking, right? Seek and ye shall find. Of course, we all know that verse. And then knowledge is, it's... uh, comes from senses derived from the verb know. It's uh, the, it, when you talk about knowledge in the sense of the fact or condition of knowing, it means the fact of knowing a thing, state, etc., or in general sense, a person, acquaintance. It's familiarity gained by experience. So you can know things by learning them, by being taught them, or you can learn things by experiencing them yourself. It's also acquaintance with fact, perception, or certain information of a fact or matter, state of being aware or informed, consciousness of anything. It's also acquaintance with facts, range of information, ken. Who knows what ken is? I didn't know what it was either. It is mental perception or recognition. Is that a word? Yeah, ken, K-E-N. It is a word. I never... Mental perception or recognition. Mm. The weird thing is when I look at the definition, it, for, the, for, 
for the definition in this context to make any sense, I had to go basically the whole way to the bottom. There was about five definitions or something, and that was the only one that made any sense. The other ones had to do with uh, like visual, like seeing it with the eye or something, um, which is kind of how, I mean, that's how knowledge is. Mm -hmm. That's how you mentally perceive something is seeing it with the eye. But Anyway, I, it was, uh, yeah, learn a new word, which I'm sure I'll forget uh, in about five minutes from now. But. So they that find the knowledge of God are seeking it. Right? You're not going to find it if you're not seeking it. And when's the last time you found something that you weren't seeking for? Unless you just happen to stumble across it, I suppose. But, uh, Proverbs 2, 4 through 5. It says, If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. You've got to be seeking it first in order to find it. So therefore, those who are seeking to know the facts and truth about God will find it in the Word of God, and when they do, they will recognize that wisdom's words are right. Right? Wisdom's words are right to them that find knowledge. They find it because they were looking for it. When they are looking for it and seeking it and they find it, they find the words to be right. They recognize that, wow, these words are true and right and righteous. But in order to be seeking it in the first place, you have to be a child of God because a, a, a reprobate is not going to seek the truth. They don't, they don't care about the truth. It's foolishness to them. So these people will receive wisdom's words, not as the words of men, but as the word of God, which is the truth. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. This is a indication that a person is a child of God when he receives the words of God, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul writes to this Thessalonian church and he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They heard the word from men, but they didn't hear it as of men. They didn't think that it was Paul's words. They recognized that the words that Paul was relaying to them came from Jesus Christ. He said, Paul said his revelation he got not of men, not by men, but by Jesus Christ. And when you receive the word of God like that, as it is in truth, the word of God, that effectually worketh in you that believe. That makes a change in your life. Because you're receiving the scripture as it is in truth. It is truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. So, just to summarize, sometimes you can get lost, miss the whole forest for the trees. They are all plain to him that understandeth. That's the words of wisdom. To the person that understands is the person that is born again, regenerated. He's been given the ability to understand. When he reads the word of God, they're plain to him, especially when he's learned how to compare scripture with scripture. And he's got a preacher to help him out when he comes across hard parts that he doesn't understand. Then it becomes very plain to him. It's manifested through preaching. And they are right, wisdom's words are right, to them that find knowledge, which are those that are seeking for knowledge. And when they are looking for it and they find it, they found something that is right. They know that it's true, it resonates in their heart, mm -hmm. and they cling to it. They receive it as the word of God, not as the word of men. And that takes care of Proverbs 8, 8 and verse 9. Just a quick note at the end of the sermon. The most important thing a believer in Jesus Christ can do is to be a member of one of God's true churches. If you're not already a member of one, go to pastorwagner.com slash churches to see if there is a true church or other believers of like faith near you. That's pastorwagner.com slash churches.